Happy September. The weather's a little crazy, but if you are um, here for the first time, we would just like to welcome you. Anybody here for the first time? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, I will put you on the spot. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you don't have a place to call home, we gladly open our, 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 our doors to you and our arms to you and welcome you to the house of the Lord. And so somebody say, are you ready for eternity? You don't have to say it in that, in that tone, but nudge the person next to you and say, are you ready for eternity? So for the next four weeks, we will be talking about eternity, but more importantly, preparing ourselves and our souls for eternity. Man is a creature of time. We take our time. We use our time. We depend on time. Life in general is controlled by time. Time, however, as important as it may be, has no relation to eternity. Eternity is unique. It is incomparable. It has no measurable length or, or, or breadth or depth nor height. And so in these next four weeks, we're going to understand it just a little bit better and go into the word. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So many things that we do today won't make sense because they do not compare to what we will be doing in eternity. But we're gonna go today to the beginning of time from Genesis to understand why, import, why eternity is so important. Why we need to be ready, why we need to prepare ourselves to get to eternity or where we will spend eternity. So with the end time, eternity will reveal so many wonders, so many miracles that today we will not understand. Everything that we do from the day to day, from, from getting ready in, in the morning to getting dressed, to picking up coffee, to getting our kids ready, to everything that we do might not make sense or will not make sense when we get to eternity. Because it's a whole different kingdom, and we'll get there in just a couple of seconds. But go with me to Revelation 1-7. It says that when the Lord returns... All eyes shall see him. And so there is a God who is omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent. And what this means is that our God in, in all knowing, in all power, and all goodness, this God that knows all things, understands all things, sees all things, is all good, and is all powerful, has set eternity in our hearts. From the moment we were created in the image of God, he already placed eternity in our hearts. The Bible says that we were created in the image of God. And being created in the image of God, he has already placed, knowing all things, all powerful and all good, he has placed eternity in each and every one of our hearts. So the question I'm asking you today is this. Don't answer out loud. But am I heaven ready? Am I heaven ready? Do I live every single day of my life, every decision of my life, from the way that I spend my money, to the way that I get dressed, to the way that I, I play and interact with my daughters, to the way that I serve and love my husband, everything that I do, do I live eternally focused? Do I live with my eyes fixed upon eternity and heavenly things and not just on what I currently see here on earth. The question I ask you today to get us ready and set us into motion for these next four weeks is, am I heaven ready? And so in order to understand the end times, we gotta go back to the beginning. Throughout the Bible, the word sin is mentioned more than 350 times. In the Bible, in Romans 6, 23, says that the wages of sin is death. And so throughout man's history, we have seen that man will often take, take the blame off of himself when they've sinned or when they've messed up and put it on somebody else. 
It's part of that fallen nature. It's part of that pride issue that we have, that we don't want to take responsibility for our actions. We don't want to take responsibility for the way that we mess up, and we kind of push that onto someone else. See, the root of man's problem cannot be dealt with education, psychology, although I'm a big fan of psychology and getting to the root of things, technology, money, because sin is a spiritual problem, it must be dealt with accordingly. You're with me? That because sin is a spiritual issue, we cannot pay out sin, we cannot do so much therapy that it outrights sin, we cannot be so technology focused that it somehow erases our hard drive and erases sin. Because sin is a spiritual issue, we need to deal with it in a spiritual way. And so we're going to go to the beginning of time because we got to get to the root. You got to deal with the root. And church, I want to challenge you this morning that in these next four weeks, you would do some work within yourself to deal with some of the roots in your life. When you look at, at trees or plants or things that are planted underground, roots are underground. Roots are underground. You cannot see them because they're, they're, it's something that is hidden. It's something that's underneath very much like the roots are the things that hold us bound inside, internal. We cannot always see them. You don't know what you're struggling with. You don't know what generational curses your family may be, may be fighting because it's, it's an internal thing but the thing about roots is this, is that it includes an anchorage of the plant. It includes something that anchors the plant so deep. With that anchorage is an absorption, absor absorption of water, absorption of water. With that, there's a shortage of nutrients and it binds all of the soil and all of the particles together. Why do I say this? Because these words are so heavy that with things that are so deeply planted underground and in the roots, we find anchorage, something that pulls it down a heavy weight. We find something that is being absorbed. We find the shortage of something, and we find something that is being bound together. Do you understand how strong these words are if you're capturing this in the spirit? Do you understand how heavy it is to be anchored to something besides Jesus? Do you understand that when something is being absorbed in your life, consumed, it's difficult to find joy and peace in other situations or scenarios? Do you understand that when there's a shortage of that peace, you'll feel anxious, you'll feel overwhelmed, you'll feel all the negative and heavy things in your life. And that when you're bound to something, whew, you cannot walk in freedom. And so I challenge you that in these next four weeks, you would ask the Lord, Lord, what are some things that, what are some things and what are some roots that go so deep in my life that I need to yank out? What are some things, whether they be lust, whether they be lies, whether they be a substance, whether they be whatever it may be, would you ask the Lord that in these next few weeks, he would reveal to you things that are so deeply rooted, sinful behavior, sinful nature that is so deeply rooted in your bloodline and in you that it's been difficult to walk in the freedom that God has called us to. Go with me today to John chapter three. I wanna introduce you to a man named Nicodemus. The Bible says now that there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus and at night said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not in him. We know you came from God because the things that you're doing, nobody would be able to do if they did not have the power of God within them. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. 
And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So, so it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can it be, Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Verse 12 says, I have spoken to you of earthly things. Somebody say earthly things. And you don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak of earthly things? This is a religious leader who approaches Jesus. And he goes up to him and he's telling him, Jesus, the things that I am watching you do, there's a power inside of you that is different, unlike anyone else that we have seen. And Jesus replies to him and says, unless we are born again, we will not see the kingdom of God. What he was telling Nicodemus was a new birth needs to take place inside of you. And the first step of us dealing with the root is to acknowledge that there is a problem that there is something that is wrong, that there is something that is unsettling, there is something that is not okay. Jesus is teaching the truths of eternity here. He's teaching the truths of heaven. He's saying, hey, some of us have overstepped some lines. We've, some, some lines that were forbidden, some laws that I've kept, you've overstepped them, you've broken them, we've kind of messed up. And so in order for us to understand eternity, we're gonna have to understand the beginning. And so if you've been a follower of Jesus for a very long time, I'm taking you to a scripture that you, you, you've probably heard multiple times. But if you're newer to the faith or this is your first time, I, I just want to take you to the beginning of time, Genesis. And I want to introduce you to a word that we hear a lot in church and a word that we hear all the time, sin. Sin is this immoral act considered to be a transgression or something against a divine law. The word sin literally means missing the mark. It indicates that there's a failure, that what we should do or should have done, we miss the mark. Anybody miss the mark here? I do it all the time. We miss the mark. Things that we were supposed to do, we miss it because we're imperfect. See, originally, man was created in the image of God. We were to live in, in, in divine union with God. We were to have authority over all creation. And then Adam and Eve failed. Adam and Eve messed up. And all of a sudden, we have the fall of man. It was a simple rule that was given to Adam and Eve. It seems, it seems so simple that you almost want to judge and you almost want to, like, come on, Adam and Eve. Like, you had one job one job. God said you have access to everything here except that tree. And they're like, hold on. This one looks good. I'm tempted to judge, but if you have ever eaten Korean barbecue or all you can eat sushi, Come on, somebody, take me to dinner after this. Come on, where are the Korean barbecue people in this place? Okay, see you tomorrow. Where are the sushi people in this place? Hey, okay, let me try to remember faces. Somebody capture this on the camera. But you pay a certain amount, right? And it's like, in this amount, all of this is included. And you're like, all right, these are all the meats I can eat. But then like a, a gorgeous like tomahawk steak walks out and you're like, mm, that's better than what, that meat looks better than my little slab of meat. Or like in, in the sushi world, like you get access to all of the different fishes, but like a bluefin tuna, and then you're just like, hold on, that fish is significantly better than the fish that I just ate. So we're tempted to judge, but when you see something better in your life, you're like, that looks a lot better than what I've previously had. 
uh, tastes a lot better than what I've previously had. I'd rather have the good meat than the bad meat. I'd rather have the good fish than the bad fish. I'd rather have the good stuff than the cheap stuff that I've been eating. And all of a sudden, you're like, hold on, that's di- there's, some, there's different about, that's a, qual- that's a higher quality that. So I don't know if the tree of the knowledge of good in life was like, you know, the Wagyu steak or like the bluefin tuna. I'm, I'm trying to simple it down for all of us, but so you don't judge Adam and Eve so quickly, but they had access to everything there except this tree. And they're like, but... This one, this one. And because they thought, and because they they took an attempt to think, hold on, big guy, we got it from here. We'll take it from here. I know better, I got this. Because they thought that they can either outsmart God or be like God, you fill in the blank. Because they just flat out disobeyed. We now have the fall of man, that they sinned, and because they ate from the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sin now entered the world. And this is important for us to understand, because there are now consequences to that sin. It had consequences for them, church, but guess what? It has consequences for you too. Anybody inherit something they didn't want? Yeah. My temper, no. Fill in the blank. You've ever inherited something that you didn't, you didn't want? You didn't even meet your great grandpa and you inherited something from them. You didn't even meet your great grandma and all of a sudden you've inherited something from family members that you've never even met. You've inherited things from people that you didn't even know, you didn't even want, right? You're like, oh, they couldn't leave me you know, wealth. No, I got, oh, cool, we got this. All right, well, this is what we're working with. It's the same with Adam and Eve. We inherited the consequences of sin, and now we are sinful in nature for something that we didn't even know, didn't do, weren't even there. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, they now became enslaved to sin, and because they became enslaved to it, and because it started to build that gap and that separation between God and them, We now, there is now a separation between you and God. There's a gap. Romans 5, 12 says this, that when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. You may ask yourself, but I wasn't even there. What are you talking about? And yet we inherited something that we didn't even want from people that we didn't even know. And we know that God cursed the ground. We know that Mama's in the house that you now have pain, hallelujah, when you give birth. That the world was now cursed because of their disobedience, because of their pride, because of their wanting to be like God. And death came into the world, separation, alienation. All of a sudden, the human race was now flawed, imperfect. And all of this because we were affected by sin. So now there's a separation between God and us. The Bible says that we're all born having committed as if we were participating in the same sin that Adam participated in. And so 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says this, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits then, what he comes, those he belong to him, then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Paul is saying that even though through Adam the fall happened, now there's a second Adam named Jesus, and now we have promise, salvation, and redemption. So it doesn't stop there with the sin. It doesn't stop there with the fall. Let me give you the remedy before we get into eternity. The counterpart of the fall is the resurrection or the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That all in Adam die, but all in Jesus Christ now have life. So by blood, we're related to Adam and Eve. We were in bondage to sin, 
But if and if when we repent, if and when we repent of our sins, accept Jesus as our Savior, and like Nicodemus, decide to be born again, die to self and say, I'm about to live a new life all over again. I don't know what it means. That may be a little bit scary. That may be a little bit confusing. If like Nicodemus, you're questioning, what does it mean to be born again? Like I physically can't, thank God that we can't physically go back into the womb. Oh God, thank God. Thank, oh my gosh. Come on, Siri. She's not sure she understands. Church, are you understanding? Okay, somebody, let's walk Siri through the prayer of salvation. If like Nicodemus, you're, you're struggling to understand, what would that even mean? What, what does that mean? It means that we're accepting the remedy that Jesus gave. That if we decide to die to self and to be born again and to live a new life, a life of transformation, it will not be perfect, church. We will miss the mark again. We will sin again. We will miss it again. We will be a little bit messy sometimes. It's it's not gonna be picture perfect. Anybody who's been running this race long enough knows it's not picture perfect. It's not picture perfect. But if we accept the remedy through Jesus Christ, if we decide that we could be born again, then the new life of eternity is given to us forevermore. See, Jesus shed his blood for the remission of our sins. That just means that he put away, he put away all of our sins for us. But that can only be effective and that can only be beneficial to us if we receive him as our Lord and Savior. Jesus was speaking about this future perspective. He was speaking about us being eternally focused. He was talking about the way that we live here on earth must, we must make decisions in order to keep us focused and in order to keep us, in order to keep us focused on eternity. See, he wanted to explain to his disciples then, but in the same way that he wants to explain to us now, that he was coming back again for his people. He wanted to explain to his disciples, hey, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. In the same way that he wants to explain to us now, hey, I left, but I'm coming back. I'm not here with you now. The Holy Spirit is here with you now, but I'm coming back for you. And so church, during this time of you waiting for the second coming of Christ, Jesus is telling you, hey, I don't want you to be passive. I don't want you to just sit there and wait. You ever go to a waiting room or like you're waiting for your car and you're just sitting? Like you're just sitting because you have nothing to do, right? You're just waiting. Kudos to the people that take a book. Kudos to people that take like a laptop and start doing work. Other people are just scrolling through social media waiting. (laughs) And you're just like, look, I'm gonna be here for two, three hours. I have nothing to do. Like, I'm just gonna do nothing. He was saying, that's not the waiting I want you to do. He was saying, I don't want you to to just be passive as you wait. I don't want you to just sit there and just wait for time to go by. I want you to get to work. And here's some examples. He's saying, I want you to get to heaven. And I want you to get to heaven joyfully. I mean, we're going to get to heaven joyfully. But he doesn't want us to get there with a bunch of, with a line of a bunch of regrets. Like, man, Lord, I ran this race, but Lord, I did this. Lord, I made it but not with a like, oh, I barely made it type of mentality. Like, whoo, I'm surprised. I'm surprised I made it, big guy. He doesn't want us to get there with a bunch of regrets. He's saying, I want you to live down here so that everything that you do down here, it matters up there. It ranks up currency up there. It stores up treasures up there. I want you to operate heaven down knowing that this is the prize, knowing that this is the ultimate gain, not that this is all I see and this is the only thing that matters here on earth, what tomorrow looks like or what this week or what this month or what the next couple of years look like, but that you would stay focused to look up at heaven, that you would make every decision here on earth with eternity in mind and that you would recognize that everything here on earth is actually temporary. Nothing here on this earth will last. See, church, life is all about perspectives. All about perspectives. The truth is, your perspective is your reality. We talked about this in our leadership meeting this Monday. Your perspective is your reality. If you perceive someone to be mean, you think they're mean. I, on the other hand, could be like, man, what are you talking about? They're the sweetest person ever. They're 
They're so, and somebody's like, are you sure? No, that, they're not. Your perception is your reality. It becomes truth to you. Change your mind. Try to change someone's mind. Android users, try to change my mind. I'm just, hey. Try to change my mind. You ruined my group chats. <laughs> try to change my mind. Try to change your mind about a meal or a place you go or try to convince someone like this place is better or this is, try to change someone's mind about something basic. People fight about like the most simplest things, but they will defend their truth so much because your perception is your reality. And when you have the idea of something and your brain is convinced about it, it becomes your truth. Not the truth. Not the truth. You got that? It becomes your truth. It becomes your reality. And so it is natural for us as humans here on earth to have about a 50 to 60 year driven perspective. Max, right? You don't think, we don't even ask like, hey, where do you see, Crystal, where do you see yourself in like 50 years? No, I would ask her, where do you see yourself in like five years? Most of us don't even span out that, that long. Where do you see yourself in 50 years? Where do you see yourself in six years? We don't even go that far. We usually limit ourselves to the five year, 10 year plan. Like that's enough, right? right? Scripture says don't worry about tomorrow. So I'm not trying to think about the 10 year plan. <laughs> all good things right 401ks life insurance 403s like investments save all good things all great things let me emphasize that all great things all of them teach us stewardship all of them if you have family you should have life insurance if you have family you should have savings you should have investments all good things yes stay with me the reality of it is is all of us max out on that 10, 20 at the max, 50 year driven perspective, where what am I gonna do when I retire? What am I gonna do when I get there? What Jesus wants us to have is an eternal perspective. Why? Because when you have eternity in mind, when you have an eternal perspective, you set goals differently. You also endure things differently. It allows you to stay focused on a whole different level because you start to realize that this is not the only thing that matters. That things here on earth are not the only thing that, are they important? Yes, they're important. Relationships are important. People are important. Life is important. Our job, good stewardship, yes, it is important. But it's not a passivity of like, I'm just gonna sit here and wait until Jesus comes back. It's a, I wanna bear good fruit, I wanna do things, I wanna keep this kingdom in mind until he returns. Church, like Nicodemus, you gotta be born from above. You gotta be born from above, you gotta be born again. What does that mean? That means that you gotta die to self. Like, Christina's not enough. I gotta renew, I need to die to everything that I am, every, my character, my personality. I gotta die to my wants, to my desires, and say, Lord, what do you want for me? The reality of it is, is that you and I, we're Nicodemus. We're the Nicodemus in the story. We are the Nicodemus in the story. We are he, he is us. That he's asking Jesus, like, what do I gotta do to get up there? What do I need to do right here, right now, Jesus? I'm standing right in front of you. What do I need to do? Rick Warren, one of, you know, one of the greatest pastors of our day says that faith is a way of looking at the world from God's perspective. Not from yours. Not from your perspective. Not from the world's perspective. Faith is a way of looking at the world from God's perspective. Imagine if you viewed everything in your life from God's perspective and not yours. You would fight for your marriage harder. You would save better, you would give more. You would give more of your time, you would give more of your finances because you would realize that there is a kingdom up there that God is gonna restore and fill and it's not just about you. John says in 2 John 1, 8, he says, watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Watch out that you don't lose all of the things that you keep working for. 
Watch out that you don't lose sight of the things that you keep ah, trying to do. Right after that verse, he says that anyone who runs this race, anyone who runs but does not continue the teaching of Jesus, there's a disconnect then from the Father. But anyone who continues to abide by his teachings, anyone that continues to live this out and live for him, stays connected to the Father and the Son. Church, God wants you to receive the full reward. God wants you to receive the full reward. And the reality is that as humans, we like incentives. Incentives are good, right? They encourage us, they, they motivate us, they, they get us to do something. I am now on week three of giving my kindergartner a lot of incentives. Call it bribery, call it what you will. I like to call it incentives. And some of you have been so kind to also pour into the incentives. Thank you, team. Thank you, fam. That you're like, hey, how does she do today? How long was the fit this morning? You know, take her to McDonald's after school. Take her to, you know, Baskin Robbins. Take her to go get some boba. We are on week three of incentives. And this five-year-old's still does not like kindergarten. Incentives are good. They're good. They get us, they motivate us to do something. They get us to do something. It, you know, it encourages us to, to get on the move. Like, okay, if I, I know that I'm going to get a prize. I know that I'm going to get a reward at the end. I know that I'm going to get something good out of this. Incentives are good. Like, we, we like them. We like, they work at work. Do they work at work? I'm looking at the bosses in the room. Come on, kingdom entrepreneurs. Shout out. They work. Like, hey, if you meet, you know, your quota, or if you meet, you know, if you meet this, you'll get, you know, $100. You're like, yes, I'm doing it on top of a paycheck. Come on. <laughs> if you get, you know, if you're in sales or whatever, those little incentives, they work. Incentives are, they're a good thing. You reward when, when you earn something. You reward when, when you deserve something. And Jesus, God wants us, he wants us to receive the full reward. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6, he says this, therefore we are always confident, always confident. Anybody always confident? Rarely. But kudos to that. Anyone, you know, take notes on the people that are always confident always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. What he's saying is that if we're here, we are then away or separated from God. That if we are here in our body, in the flesh, that means that we're away from him. But God, he is a reward. He is the prize. He says, I didn't come to condemn the world. That was the beginning of time. That was the fall of man. That's where it went wrong. That was the problem. He's saying, I'm the solution. I'm the remedy. I didn't come to condemn the world. Like he didn't come to set us up for failure, church. He came to save the world out of whatever mess that we got ourselves into. He came to be the remedy. He came to fix what was already broken. He's saying, that's why I sent my son. That's why I sent you the solution. That's why I sent you the savior of the world. Church, let me remind you today that there is nothing, 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 and I mean nothing that you could do that could ever separate you from the love of God. Nothing. You can't do more for him. You're not a puppet. You can't do more him and be like, good job. Good job. You taught on Wednesday. Good job. You taught on Friday. Good job. You were there on Sunday. Great job. I love you more. That doesn't work. He doesn't love us more because we do or because we perform. That's anti-biblical. So that nothing would be able to separate you from your love. But let me tell you this, that we can make him more or less pleased with us. That's different. That doesn't mean that, that his love for us changes. That doesn't mean that there, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love us less or love us more. It does mean that he may be a little displeased. Parents in the room will understand that. You don't love your kids less. You're just like, oh, no, they missed it today. <laughs> They did not get it right today. We'll try tomorrow. Parents will get that. 
that you love your kids so much that your love for them does not change. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10 says this. Again, he starts this verse by saying, we are confident. Paul, this is a confidence I need to get on. Church, this is a confidence, a spiritual confidence that we need to live out every single day. He says, we are confident. And I say that I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. In other terms, he's saying like, I, I rather, I rather not be here and I rather be up there because if I'm up there and I'm physically not here, then I'm united with him. So we make it our goal to please him. Church, we gotta make it our goal to please God, whether we are at home in the body or away with him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body. Let me say that one more time. So that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body whether good or bad, meaning whatever we did in this body that we have, we gotta get ready to appear before judgment. We gotta get ready to appear before the judge. And don't be so quick to think that this judge is all about condemnation. The word in, in Hebrew is krima. It, we later get the word crime from that, right? Like if you committed a crime, it's stemming from the Hebrew word krima, which means a decision resulting from an investigation. A decision resulting from an investigation. Jesus is gonna do an investigation in our lives. He's not just so quick to like judge and be like, you did this, you did that, you did that, you did that, you did that. I saw like an Instagram post one time that said like, only Jesus or only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. Yeah, church, you should be afraid of that. I much rather be judged by all of you than to be judged by the creator. Much rather, you judge me all you want because you're probably gonna get it wrong. We much rather be judged by people. And yet as the body of Christ, right? How, we've all heard it, Christians are so judgmental. Who cares, let them judge you. The ultimate judge, you're gonna have to give accounts to the ultimate judge one day. That's way scarier. That's way scarier than people having this false perception of who you are. Because they didn't even take the time to get to know you. Because they didn't even ask you about who you were and what you're going through. Because they didn't even take the time to get to know your personality. Like, if people don't take time to get to know you, why are you so concerned about what they think about you? Oof. That was from the Holy Spirit, because that was not in my notes. Like, why are you so concerned about the opinions of people that have not even, you haven't even had coffee with them or broken bread with them, and you're so concerned about what they think about you? And yet they've never asked, hey, bro, how are you doing? Hey, bro, how are you really doing? Hey, I miss you. Like, is that, you're good? Don't be so concerned about the judgments of people. But this word, krima, it means that Jesus will do a full investigation of what we said, of what we thought, of how we acted, of how we worked, of our motives, of our actions, of everything that we did. And Paul says, my conscience is clear. He says, that doesn't make me innocent. That doesn't make me innocent, but my conscience is clear. That doesn't make me perfect. It doesn't mean that I got it all the time. It doesn't mean, it doesn't make me innocent. It says, it is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from the Lord. It says that he will bring out all the dark secrets inside of us and he will bring them to light. Churches, Jesus examines us. Examines us. We will either reap the prize, the reward, the crown, or this is the scary part, you will quite possibly take the biggest loss in your life. The biggest punishment, the biggest penalty. And so you can choose the reward, which is eternity, or you can choose the loss, you can choose the punishment, which is hell. And the truth is that how we decide to live here on earth determines where we will end up. That what we do with the time here on earth determines where we will spend eternity. 
rejoicing, worshiping, joyful, dancing, singing, praising, doing it all, having a good time, or in hell, or in hell, burning, suffering, what you do on the time, with your time here on earth, will determine where you end up for eternity. So are you ready for eternity, church? Are you ready for eternity? I'm gonna ask everybody to stand up in this moment. And deacons, if you can get ready for communion, I'm not gonna do an altar call today. You will have to come back next week and the week after and the week after and the week after to complete this series. But are you ready for eternity? I want you to just take some time to think and just ask the Lord, Lord, right now, just do a full investigation. Just do a full investigation of my heart. Do a full investigation of my thoughts. Do a full investigation of my works. Do a full investigation of my motives. Nobody here knows me. Nobody knows the real me. Nobody knows your actions. Nobody knows the real you here but him, but the one that created you. Nobody knows the intentions of your heart. Nobody knows your motives. Nobody knows what you think. Nobody knows how quick or how dark your thoughts get. Nobody knows how impulsive your thoughts may get. Like all of a sudden you just whew, went so quickly from zero to 60. Nobody knows, but would you ask the Lord, Lord, do a full investigation of my heart. Do a full investigation of my thoughts. Do a full investigation of my words. Father, do a full investigation. Church, with, with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're gonna get ready to examine our hearts and ask the Lord to examine and to scrutinize our hearts as we get ready to take communion. If you've been baptized in water, it doesn't matter if it was years ago, it doesn't matter if your life's a little messy right now. If you've been baptized in water, I highly encourage you today to retake it. it may have been years ago, but if, you, if you've been baptized in those holy waters, I encourage you today to take communion again and just ask the Lord, would you search my heart? Lord, would you examine every heart and every motive? So Father, I thank you for your bread. I thank you, Lord, for the wine that is represented, Lord, of, of your body, Lord, and the remedy that you sent so that we could walk in freedom. Father, I pray, Lord, right now that you would just do a full investigation of our lives and a full investigation of our hearts, Lord. Father, there's a reason that everyone that is here today is here lord and we pray for those that are watching online we pray for our extended family that isn't physically in the house today but are watching us online we we pray for family members that maybe had previous commitments lord but god right now we stand in the gap lord for our loved ones we stand in the gap lord because when we get to eternity we want to see lord all our loved ones there and so father search our hearts search our thoughts our minds god Bless this time, bless the bread, bless the wine in your precious name. We say amen.